Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of How to Live to 200, where we focus on the science and practice of health, human performance, and longevity. On today's episode, I had the opportunity to talk with Bob Troya, or Quantified Bob as he calls himself. Bob's a little different than our prior guests. While he's a biohacker living in New York City, he's also a software engineer and a total data geek who takes his personal data analysis to a whole nother level. So to all you tech nerds or software developers listening, this episode is for you. We talk about the API he's built for his personal data and the underlying software architecture, everything he tracks, and some of the software analysis tools he loves. And even if you're not, our discussion about the environmental factors he monitors and manages, such as air quality, water quality, and the electromagnetic radiation that's emitted from all the myriad of devices around us is really fascinating. And you know I love tools and apps too, and Bob does not disappoint with his recommendations. He's very specific about his own trial and error process on specific tools to measure glucose, ketones, and he's another fan of the Aura Ring. As a software entrepreneur myself, and obviously a quantified self-geek, I love to hear how Bob applies these principles to his own data collection, storage, his software stack, and his analysis. And he even gives an unprompted shout out to another Seattle data geek. You'll have to listen to find out who that is. And now, this is how to live to 200. So, Bob, thanks a lot for uh, joining us on the show today. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, having me on. So you've talked about sort of being your own API. First, for the people who are not technologists in our audience, what is an API and how have you sort of applied that to yourself? API is just an acronym for uh, application programming interface. And, and really all that means is building an endpoint that you can communicate with that can then retrieve information from a, let's say, another database and structure it in a certain way and return it back to you um, so that it can be integrated into another piece of software or made it, make it human readable, et cetera. So what I did was I basically over the past few years, I've been gathering so much self-collected data from many different sources. Some of it's through like apps and tools or wearables. Um, some things are pencil and paper or manually con um, collected or a scale that wasn't a smart scale. And I just wanted, I needed a place to sort of put all this information. So I, I just started figuring out ways to get all this aggregated data together um, just so I know I could access it anytime I wanted to. I was also a little bit concerned about a lot of the, um, there's a lot of companies out there that come and go. And so like you might've had a wearable and that company went out of business and then they say, we're, you know, we're going to wipe away all the data. Well, I wanted to have an archive of all that stuff because maybe in 10 years, I want to go back and look at that. So I, uh, I really just wanted it more as a, as a data warehouse, just something to archive all this information. And of course, then once you have the data, you can do interesting things with it in terms of querying it or trying to find some insights or correlations with it. Let's dissect that a little bit. So when you think about your own data warehouse, what are the kinds of apps, tools, or data you've collected over time? Well, there's many layers. So you've got everything from uh, lab tests, whether it's like things like your annual checkup or blood work, to um, biometric data, so things you may be collecting off of a wearable, whether it's, uh, you know, back in the day, I had a device called the Basis, and then they got bought by Intel and went out of business, and I had a Fitbit, or I'm sorry, a Jawbone, and they kind of went out of business in the Fitbit, and now I have an Aura Ring. Um, so that, and that, those are all collecting, not all, some of the same data points, but some of them were unique to those devices. Um, things like sleep data, again, um, then you've got uh, testing like genetic data, uh, gut microbiome data, environmental data. So there's layers to this, right? Some things are pretty much like set and forget it. Like you can just sort of passively be collecting this information, whereas other things may require you to uh, manually add a record. So for example, if I'm testing the pH of my saliva for a week, uh, I may have to scribble those down or enter them in through a simple interface I built that just dumps that into my to my database. So you're, you're basically creating all these layers that have different levels of granularity. And, um, you know, and, and, and is it overkill? Well, it's just a matter of, I just want all the data in one place. I'm not necessarily going over minute by minute heart rate data all the time, but I can, if I need to, I can zoom in on, you know, I can look from 30,000 feet away and see sort of some baselines and trends, but I can zoom in if I want to, and really trying to hone in on, let's say, oh, I was traveling that day or something was going on that day and, and figure out, you know, maybe, 
whether I'm trying to just diagnose something or um, find a correlation with, with something else. So let's let's even go a little deeper. Like, tell us more about the actual architecture of what you built. So what I built originally, and it's actually I'm in, I'm in the process of just overhauling the whole thing, just because uh, the technologies that we have access to now have, have, have kind of advanced. Even the idea of APIs, like if you want to really geek out, where you are putting data into like APIs and data's in JSON, and the person requesting it, like every time you update the API, you'd have to update the way the response comes back. And now we have the things that are like called GraphQL where you leave it up to the client to just query and it's sort of self-documenting and it just lets it be a much smarter interface. But so the technologies were originally uh, a database called MongoDB on the back end, which is a document database. Um, I just found that that let me have more flexibility with different data types. Uh, and then really just sitting on top of it was a, uh, it was all JavaScript based, uh, a node, node JS node server um, that had, different security on top of it so I can create API keys to give to people so that it wasn't like a publicly accessible, uh, you know, endpoint. So you'd have to kind of get permission and say, I, you know, I have this key, I can make a request with this key and get data back. And, and are you sharing the data with other people? The older version is, is some, yeah, people request an API key, I share it with them. And it's, it's really just a, that database is not... <laughs> Because I'm in the process of migrating everything over to a new architecture, there, that data that's still there, it works. The API works. Everything that's been documented works. Um, in terms of how frequently that stuff's being updated in that data warehouse, um, it's not like – it's more of an archive. So they could see how it all works. What's what's the new system going to look like? So the new system is um, – well – you know, because I started really going down building more mobile first uh, things, I mean, my backgrounds, I mean, I'm a technology guy, but also an entrepreneur, but we, me and a buddy sort of uh, said about a year ago, we'd roll up our sleeves and be like, let's learn latest and greatest and mobile and databases and middleware and all, all these things to basically figure out, like, if I had to do this from scratch, how would I do it today? Uh, so like database wise, um, I'm moving over to Postgres mainly because I get the benefits of a relational database, but I can also put in, there's document hooks and um, there's also add-ons. There's a thing called timescale DB, which is great for um, large data sets of just timestamp sort of data. Um, it can scale, like they use this in financial applications, things like that. So it's probably overkill <laughs> for, for me, for myself, but it's just cool to kind of go through the experience of, of building out that architecture. Um, so on, And then you've got, um, whereas we were running, uh, I had Node.js with sort of this JSON kind of um, data format to send data back to the user. Now it's all GraphQL. So um, basically you have still essentially a Node server uh, mm -hmm. using tools like um, uh, there's a middleware piece called uh, GraphQL that sits between the database and, and the mm -hmm. GraphQL server. And then there's some libraries under the hood there that, do the translation and um and then you've got essentially on the front end you can you can pick some different you can in terms of what that actual server end piece is um like there's a library called apollo um they do their own thing you can you can still use node.js or things like express so um you know it, the idea is like a lot of the the guts and the the heavy lifting's been developed and that's what i kind of like because i'm you know, I, I'm about like kind of assembling the solution. Let's not so much getting into the weeds of the, <laughs> the like building specific little libraries. I like to just be able to cobble things together with what's out there. And are you building this just for yourself or do you plan to make this available for other people to utilize to store their own data? Uh, at the moment, it's, it's basically just been for myself because I, I, it's, it's been this constant work in progress. And once I get it to where I want it to suit my needs for myself, when you start opening it up for other people, now you're trying to build something that suits the masses. And maybe that maybe what I want isn't what the masses want. But it, but that being said, the same technology is going to be underpinning some other things that I'm building. So uh, I've got some other apps and tools and platforms that may be powered under the hood by what I'm building for myself. So, you know, just so I can, I can reapply that, but not necessarily make it like a open, like, uh, Hey everybody, you know, connect all your stuff here. Um, there, there's a lot of folks out there kind of doing that in different ways. Um, you know, like I, I'm very big on the data. I'd rather have really beautiful data the way it's put together than worry about for me, like some 
cool slick dashboards and visualizations because I feel like oftentimes, I mean, I've spent years building technology, marketing technology companies. You make these cool dashboards that your client can put in the conference room up on the wall and it doesn't necessarily say a whole lot, but it looks nice. And I'd rather have the data where I can, if I know how to query it, I can, I can get, pull stuff out of there that I find useful. Let's talk about some of your, your own personal experimentation on top of this data. What have been things that you've wanted to test? What data did you collect and what insights did you have? Well, so with data, a lot of it is kind of almost looking at things you've already collected and, tr- and then you're discovering things about yourself. So an example could be like, let's say you're tracking your sleep data. Uh, you might be tracking your heart rate variability data and maybe you're tracking things like alcohol consumption. And to me, I would, I would say like, well, if I typically heart rate variability is, is your body's sort of resiliency. It's a metric of, of your body's uh, kind of parasympathetic or sympathetic response, whether it's fight or flight or rest and digest. So if you have low HRV, it's kind of a sign that your body's kind of, whether you're tired or overtrained or you're out partying too much last night. Uh, what, I, what I found was if I, my HRV in the morning would be elevate, be better, like in a better state. Um, on certain times when I actually was out drinking the night before, maybe not like a lot of drinks, maybe like two, you know, two glasses of wine, let's say. Um, and I couldn't really put that together and figure out why, but I had to actually take a step back. Cause again, correlation doesn't necessarily mean, um, causation. That's like a big thing in statistics. Um, you can just cause two things sort of relate to each other. doesn't mean one caused the other. What it turned out being was I, I kind of was realizing that when I'd go out and have, let's say two drinks, or two glasses of wine. It was often in a social setting with friends or people I haven't seen in a while, or, or you know, just people I care about. And the social connections that of the evening before would make me actually be like actually has an effect on your body. And, you know, the uh, you know just being around, being social is a huge impact. Um, and that's been shown with things like longevity, etc. Um, and my heart rate, my heart rate variability would actually be elevated the next day. Uh, if I had a few, but if, you know, if you go out and you have, let's say three or four drinks, then it, that, then it goes like a bell curve to it. It goes away. So I, I kind of was interested. It was interesting as like, it was like a proxy. It was like a way of showing me that something that, um, maybe I would have never, like, I wasn't structuring an experiment. It was just an insight I, I pulled out of that, out of that data. Let's talk about a couple of structured experiments that maybe you've run on yourself. Sure. Um, so the, some of the recent ones I've done are around diet and fasting, different types of fasts. Um, and these are pretty straightforward experiments. So uh, basically you're collecting some data before the experiment. Uh, you're gathering information during it. And then after the experiment completes, you want to see if things revert back or if there's been a change. And so uh, a simple one is uh, I'm doing a lot of experiments with fasting and diet, let's say around um, glucose and ketones. And that's a pretty simple thing to measure. So you, um, you know, I use a precision extra, precision extra um, uh, meter, which can have does both glucose and ketones. So, like a few weeks back, I did a, a seventy-two hour fast, so a three-day fast, just water. And I, all I was doing was twice a day measuring uh, glucose and ketones in the morning and in the evening, and just seeing how my levels, like my glucose, should be going down over time because I'm not consuming anything and and ideally, I would be getting into, I wanted to see how quickly I could get into a deeper state of ketosis. And for me, the sort of magical moment happens about somewhere around two and a half days in is where, uh, so you see this inversion where glucose is going down, ketones going up. And at about two and a half days, the, the, the curve sort of changes. The ketones go into almost more of like a hockey stick kind of mode. So that's the point where my body really shifts its fuel source over. Um, I'd done other experiments that were similar to that with like a, what's called a fasting mimicking diet where you consume uh, a minimal amount of uh, calories over five days uh, with a, a little bit more on the first day and even less than in the last four. Um, that's, that was uh, a, a, a lot of research was showing the benefits of how you can basically get all the benefits of a regular fast, but, but getting minimal amount of calories. Mm-hmm. And, but what I had in that experiment was because I even eating just like a few hundred calories a day of things like raw cauliflower and, and then a little bit of uh, sweet potato, et cetera. My glucose and ketones in that, it, during that experiment, it, at five days still went up pretty high, but it was zigzagging because every time you eat, put something in your body, you're kind of knocking yourself back out and getting back into it again. Um, 
But on that experiment, the first time I collected, I was measuring, you know, heart rate variability, pH, blood pressure, body composition, all these things. And then at the end of that experiment, I kind of saw which of those variables really didn't matter. Like I, I was like, okay, I kind of went overboard here. I was tracking like 15 things. Uh, the next time I go and do an experiment like this, I can just whittle this down to let's say whatever the, you know the three or four most important things. That way, you kind of you know we're trying to get the best bang for a buck there in terms of you know not making it just over just a burden to really track a lot of these um, metrics. Um, so that that's kind of like you know on the fasting side, yeah. And then tied in with that would be things like blood work. So you do pre post blood work um, the, with the fast. What I had read about like the fasting mimicking diet was it's really about the refeed. So at the end of the fast, when you finally get some food into your body, you have this surge of, of growth factors. So things like testosterone, et cetera. So, and I, and I basically, when I did the test post, um, it showed like my, my testosterone just shot up. Um, so my body was just coming, you know, you're coming out of this sort of like famine state and you're like, okay, I'm not going to start and your body just releases all these growth hormones. So it's a nice, for me, it was fasting is a, it's just a really nice reset. Um, you know, there's, uh, other experiments that are like around cholesterol, um, like high frequency cholesterol testing. So I, I had a device that it's, um, it's like a point of care device and it has little cartridge test, uh, test cartridges. And you have to take up like probably about three times as much blood as uh, like a glucose meter, but uh, it allows me to, it allowed me to take, uh, high frequency cholesterol measurements. Normally we just go you know, it's your checkup once a year and you get some numbers, but I wanted to see the acute effects of what I'm eating on how, how it fluctuates throughout the day or over the course of a few weeks. Um, and it was pretty interesting because I coupled that information with also with like a continuous glucose monitor. Uh, cause now they've got these, uh, monitors out there that they're, they're like the size of a, a quarter and they just fit on the back of your arm and they'll record continuously for two weeks. So I can stack that data together. And, um, and so that was an interesting thing to see if different, uh, switching up from one type of diet to another for me, what actually gave me better kind of cardiovascular risk factors versus another. Um, I, I tend to follow what you'd call more like a, a paleo type diet, um, you know, uh, in terms of lo- relative, you know, low carbohydrate, good, healthy, saturated fats, good amount of protein. But I switched for, an, for a period of time to a, uh, it was more of a vegetarian diet with a higher set with higher carbs. And, and actually that diet for me gave my, actually had worse uh, markers than going than my baseline diet, which is kind of an interesting insight. What have you changed about your fasting strategy uh, given all this testing? I personally think uh, I like, I like doing the three day fast water fast. I, uh, if possible, like what I like to do is schedule like, once, once or twice a year to do more of like a, f- a five day fast, like fasting mimicking diet, and then work in probably monthly, uh, like a three day fast. And then I do intermittent fasting, probably about five days a week where I'm probably eating most of my, all, all my calories in a window, of, let's say under eight hours. And so, and that allows me to kind of get the benefits of like, okay, I want the big reset. Okay. These are like these monthly sort of, you know, little quick resets. And then, and then just myself, just knowing my day to day, I've been, I've been intermittent fasting for a number of years and, you know, my body just likes, you know, it seems to be working for me. So, you know, like to change it around, but there's definitely a day where I I listen to my body. There might be like, Hey, so it's a weekend or something. My body's like, Hey, uh, have have some breakfast today. And actually for me, like to do it once in a while and, re, you know, increase, increase some carbs. My body's telling me to do it that one day. It's, it's not like I'm having like a cheat day or anything. It's, um, it actually, it's an, it, my body just tells me like, Hey, I need it. And then I, I go back to my other my existing sort of pro, set of protocols. If you think about your normal week, how many days a week would you end up eating breakfast? Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, I, I, I sort of do the, you know, coffee with some saturated fats in it. So butter and MCT or coconut oil. So that's like a little bit of a cheat in the morning because you're getting some calories in you, but, um, but you're not kicking yourself out of uh, ketosis in the morning. Are you doing your 72 hour fast? Are you just doing water or do you do tea, coffee or anything like that? Uh, the, the 72 hour fast is just water. Uh, some people, I mean, I get questions from folks about, can I have some coffee, can I have whatever? And I, and I tell them like, you can do whatever you 
want. I mean, I don't, you might actually have better results and maybe, maybe you get 90% of the, the result. We don't really know. Um, there are people who claim, you know, having, adding some coffee in while they're fasting actually helps them accelerate their, uh, uh, ketosis. Um, you know, it's, it's case by case. I, when I first started, I was trying to like eliminate variables. So I was just like, just water. And, you know, and then, and the only thing I did was I, I, maybe I mixed up two or three different, you know, mineral waters to make it, you know, Hey, let's not make it super boring. Like one, you know, one afternoon I'm, ha- I'm having a little, uh, San Pellegrino and next I'm having mountain Valley. And, um, but that was pretty much it. Like, so the, those, you know, when I say, when I'm saying I'm doing a water fast, it's just water. And, and, you know, you, you, with the, the only thing I would say is in the morning, just a tiny bit of uh, sea salt, just some electrolytes in the bo- to support the body a little bit. What is your, what is your personal tech stack look like now? What types of devices are you utilizing and testing right now or in the last say months period of time? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing to have like all sorts of cool toys and shiny objects and, and it's not that I'm using everything all the time. Um, so like general sort of wearables, uh, I've got an aura ring on that I keep on pretty continuously, even though it's really meant, you know, it's a sleep tracker. So it's really where it shines. Uh, I have a, I have, um, on my other arm, I just happen to have on a Fitbit blaze just because I like a second opinion on data. I just never really trust. Cause like I do see inconsistencies with things. Um, you know, I, uh, I use for a uh, heart rate variability. Uh, I just got this, th- this finger sensor called the core sense. Uh, C O R S E N S E. It's uh, it's nice because I used to do heart rate variability in the morning before you get out of bed. You'd have to either put on like a chest strap, like a Polar H10, uh, which goes Bluetooth to like a, 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 a um, HRV app on your on your phone. Uh, but now you can just slip this thing on your finger, and it's just really nice. Plus, I can do spots like if I, if I want someone else to do a reading real quick, I can just slip the the sensor on their finger without you know it's, you don't have to like put a chest strap or take off your shirt or anything like that. Um, you know, in terms of other apps and tools, um, I mean, there's, you know, I've got environmental stuff at home monitoring like indoor air quality and different components of that. Um, I've got, um, on the, on the training and recovery side, I've got all sorts of stuff. I mean, I'm helping start up this facility here in New York city, which is like the first biohacking kind of efficient exercise facility here. So we've got everything from like ARX machines, which is computer motorized, um, resistance machines to oxygen training. Uh, I think called live O2 that I, I do a few times a week. Uh, there's AI driven, uh, kind of cardio uh, cycling where it's essentially, uh, using machine learning and AI to give you in 10 minutes, the equivalent of like a, a steady state, 45 minute biking workout. Um, I, I do lots of infrared sauna, uh, red and infrared light therapy, uh, pulse electromagnetic, um, uh, frequency therapy. Um, so PEMF, um, I mean, it's just, there's just lots of things now in terms of what I use every day versus when I need them. Um, you know, that's, that's always like the, you know, the, the question, cause it's like, uh, like date, you know, I've, I have training days. I've kind of broken out my schedule for like, there's certain days for training, there's certain recovery days. And, and then from a data collection standpoint, um, you know, it, it's about getting smart data and not just, you know, as a ton of data, cause if it's garbage in, it's garbage, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. So, um, but it does, you do see some interesting trends in the data. Like when, when certain devices don't correlate, like my Fitbit and my Aura Ring sleep data are fairly off from each other. Like it's interesting to see. And I, you know, now what does that mean? Which one's right? Which one's wrong? I don't know. Are they both sort of wrong? <laughs> Probably. Um, so I look more at the trends um, of things, you know, even like the, even continuous glucose monitors, like they're like the, they, it can be off by like, 10 or 15 um, milligrams per deciliter, but the, the graph itself is accurate. So you have to sort of calibrate and decide what's that offset. Like, where do you need to re- you know, move it to? Um, because the, the way they're cal- those sensors are made, is it's like one size fits all. They, they're not calibrated. You know, the user doesn't calibrate them. They're factory calibrated. So I need to then go in and say, well, it's telling me my blood sugar is at 95, but I just checked it and I'm, I'm actually like 85. So, you know, everything's kind of off by 10. If you were talking to somebody who was just getting going in this kind of quantified health space, looking for the first device to buy, what would you recommend? 
that do you think has the sort of the right correlation between cost and benefit in a general health perspective? I think you want something like oh, definitely a, a wearable that can provide you with actionable insights. And most people that I, I deal with um, are often, you know, they're going to either, they're going to say like they sleep like crap, basically. That's like a common thread. So you want something that, you know, you at least you can start getting insights about your sleep. And so you don't need something to say to you like, well, yeah, you sleep like crap. And you go, like, I know that already, <laughs> but you need to figure out why. And so, you know, something like the aura ring where it's at least they're, they're trying to give you insights about, okay, your, your metabolism was elevated overnight. You probably ate a meal too late. It's trying to dial in, adjust your circadian rhythm to say, okay, maybe you should go to bed a half an hour early, um, earlier than normal tonight. Or it can tell you, like try to give you some interventions or advice about your lifestyle that maybe can help you know, not only to help you learn more about yourself, but also optimize around what's going to allow me to, to sleep the best. Now, the problem is all these devices, they're still in their own silos. Like the aura ring doesn't know what my environment's like. The aura ring doesn't know if you had, you know, a rough day at work or, you know, <laughs> an argument with your loved ones and stuff, something like that. So it's, I think for most people, they just need to understand kind of some baseline about themselves. Cause a lot of people, like they come to me and they'll, they'll just give me, they give me a shopping list. I'll buy everything. And then you just get overwhelmed with all these tools and toys and it's just frustrating because they don't know what to do with it. So I'd rather, you know, it's almost like get by giving yourself just like one or two simple tools and then you get your insights out of that. Then you can move on to other things. Um, Cause even just like a wearable, let's say you get like a, like a Fitbit. Let's for example, that's a pretty common device or um, you know, you're, you're going to have things like your, your heart rate and some general sense of activity uh, and, and sleep. And that, and then you can start getting some insights around that. And then if you want to kind of up the game a little bit, um, I think understanding uh, things around your, your glucose is a, it's a really, it's, a, it's easy. It's one data point. It's, you know, glucose sensors are relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, it's just a little finger prick and you put some blood onto this, onto the little um, uh, sensor, uh, onto the device and you get, you know, get a reading within like 10 minutes, 10 seconds. And I think for people to understand, not just like their behavior, like around, okay, my, my general trend is it's pretty high or I'm in a good, I'm in a good place. What I'm doing now is I'm working on experiments where I'm looking at my, I'm really trying to personalize my diet. And what I want to understand is not, you know, eating a bowl of white rice and eating a banana, like we have personal glucose responses to that. So like someone might say this has a high glycemic index, but for me, maybe eating that banana doesn't spike my blood sugar the way you it would for you. And the opposite might happen if like you ate uh, white rice and I ate white rice. Or how do you prepare the food? Well, it's, if you take white rice, you cook it, you put it in the refrigerator, cool it, then take it out and heat it again, that rice changes composition and becomes more of a resistant starch. So you start figuring out how to really personalize that diet for yourself. And, you know, and I think that's kind of the future where a lot of the stuff's trying to go where, you know, we're, we're sort of all these single subject experiments. And even if you, everyone says, well, I'm paleo and I'm paleo, it, it's just way more complex than that. Um, you know, we all have different responses to, to things we put in our bodies. Based on all your experiments, like what's one belief that most people have that you sort of disproved or debunked about yourself? That our genetics are what dictates uh, everything about us. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really big on uh, epigenetics and the effects of lifestyle and environment on our health. I feel like even with like this world of biohacking and all this, like everyone's like, I'll take all these supplements. I'll do all this and, you know, cool tech and everything. But yet they pay no attention to things like air quality EMF around them. And I feel like that's, that's the, like as big of an issue as like anything else. And, and even with genetics, it's like, those are just, you don't, you do, you go get like a 23 andme test and it might show you risk factors or things, but you don't know which of those genes are necessarily turned on. Um, but now we're getting into epigenetic testing where you can start to see what things are turned on. You can see there's tests that will show you, like, are you really being exposed to like secondhand smoke? Are you, are, are certain parts of your body aging faster than others? Um, uh, by there's, there's like consumer products coming out that are offering this, this testing along with full genome sequencing. And so I feel like, a lot of people just feel like they look at their 23 me data and they go, Oh, you know, yeah, you might have a risk or something. And they, they'll cite, and then the risk factors are tied to like, a you know, looking through a bunch of different studies. And whereas I think the epigenetics is you, that's actionable. Like you can, that's stuff you can change. You can retest it six months from now and see if what you, what interventions you did or 
um, behaviors you have move the needle. Are you using a specific epigenetic test? Yeah, there's a, the first company. Um, so there was a researcher, um, Horvath, that came up with this concept of epigenetic clock. And he was able to show how he could predict someone's age by looking at um, basically just through their taking some saliva and, and being able to like sequence and look at, look for these markers. Um, there's a company out of, in the UK now that just came out called Chronomics. Um, based on, it's like next generation of that sort of research. Uh, they just came out. My, my results are supposed to come back probably within the next week. Uh, it's just, it was just a saliva test. They'll do, they'll do that. Um, epigenetic results along with a biological age assessment. And then if you want to pay a little extra, they'll give you your whole genome sequence. And what I like about them is they're really big on because, especially because they're in the UK. Um, so there's all the sort of privacy issues, like they have a higher set of guidelines. So, um, like they don't sell your data. They won't like even in aggregate, like, you know, the other companies are doing, um, you, if you want your data, if you get access to the full, all your data, even the raw full genome, uh, which is a pretty huge data set. You, they'll destroy the data. They'll tr- destroy the physical samples if you want. So if you have any concerns about privacy, um, you know, they have to hold themselves to a much higher uh, standard than kind of what you're seeing here with like some of these uh, genetic companies in the U S that are selling your aggregate data to pharma companies. Let's come back to your own personal environment. What are you testing in your home and what are you changing in your home to uh, improve your overall health and performance? Sure. So there, there's really, you know, the three primary areas are your indoor air quality. So air quality is everything from, you know, things like temperature and humidity and optimizing that um, to looking at volatile organic compounds. These could be off gassing from furniture or carpets to uh, cigarette smoke, whether it's, I live in New York city. So like stuff comes through the windows, even if you like, you have the windows shut, like there's drafts and, and all of that. Um, so you've got all the, all the elements of air quality and you can even get into things like mold and testing for, for those types of things. Uh, then there's water quality. So there's the water we're drinking. Uh, whether you you want to filter or do things to tap water um, in your home versus drinking bottled water, or mineral water, et cetera. Uh, but what a lot of people overlook is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, look, I drank this bottled water all day. I'm putting the best stuff in my body. And then they still shower out of the same tap water and they don't filter that tap. They don't filter the shower water. And so they're basically breathing in that, you know, the, you're breathing in the same same stuff that you'd be getting out of the, of the regular faucet. So, so testing for water quality is important as well. And then, uh, and then I, what I had spent a lot of time doing was optimizing my home, looking for min- mitigating the effects of uh, electromagnetic radiation in the home. Now that can come from many things. So you everything from the the electrical wiring in the in the in your home or building or wherever you wherever you live to things like off devices or Wi-Fi routers, um, Bluetooth, et cetera. And so I'm trying to like mitigate my exposure. And the way I looked at it was, well, if I can just optimize this in my bedroom, and this is goes for everything, air quality, uh, EMF, et cetera, because you spend, let's say a third of your, your lot, your day is in the bedroom. So, and that's a pretty small, relatively contained environment. So if I can optimize that space, then I've, okay, I know I've got a third of my existence is pretty, pretty dialed in. Um, and so by using, by optimizing, even using tools, like you can discover things like I can find what temperature I sleep, I get the best sleep quality at, let's say, or, you know, I can find out, um, just like I, I was having sleep disturbances. It turned out that if you keep your door shut and my, like my bedroom door would be shut, well, carbon dioxide builds up overnight. And the air quality actually will go down and, and it gets below a certain threshold. you you may disrupt your sleep. And so I've made changes to things like having better ventilation, making sure that, um, you can even do things where if, uh, air quality, let's say, um, things like dust particles and things in the air hit a certain threshold, you can automate and have it turn on a, uh, like a HEPA filter or something in a room that just helps, you know, clear out, um, the issue that that was there so um you know you kind of build a, like a system and it, it all it all like once it's all hooked up it you know you can get some cool insights of, uh, about things but then you can also then implement solutions um to optimize what do you do to to minimize the emf uh well in my home what i did was first thing was i looked i, I checked all the wiring looked for any poor wiring whether it could be 
bad grounds, et cetera, because that will basically give off um, kind of uh, some, some electromagnetic, like you'll, you'll measure it with a meter that will show that it's kind of really spewing off. I actually had in my bedroom behind the headboard of my bed on the wall was like a, a one of those coaxial cable jacks uh, for like cable television. And I guess that was also, um, it was connected to a wire because the TV used to be on the other side of the room and it was, it wasn't well shielded. So it was, it was giving off just this massive amount of EMF. Um, and it was, and it, it was basically right, you know, since where my head was, where I was sleeping. But one of the things about EMF is the simple, uh, there's a thing called inverse square law where the power level of something goes away pretty drastically. The, like whether every, each time you double the distance from the source. So I just literally moved the bed six inches away from the wall. And then all of a sudden the levels just tell you know, tapered off. Now that's a much, that's a very localized um, kind of source of EMF. When you start talking about things like um, if you, if you live in a, in an urban environment, like I live in New York city. So there's like buildings that have essentially cell phone relay ta- relays and stuff. And if you're in any of those line of sites, that stuff can get the RF signals can get through, you know, through your windows into your home and you can, there's things you can shield. There's little like, clear films you can put on windows. Um, can't with, with the house wiring, the low frequencies, you can't really do that. Like unless you have like lead walls because it's just, it's much more difficult to shield, but we can shield from the other things like RF, you know, I turn off my Wi-Fi router at night, you know, granted there's a million other Wi-Fi routers in my neighborhood. So I can't turn all of them off, but I can try to mitigate as much as I can. Um, on the personal level, I, like I don't, I don't, um, I, I don't use things like Bluetooth, like on me, like as much like my, my aura ring is basically an airplane mode all the time. It's like, that's what, one of the things I like about the device is I can actually disable any signal transmissions from it. Um, and the only time it goes on is when I want to take it off and sync up my data in the morning. And like my phone has an EMF protection on it. My laptop underneath it has a, um, uh, like a, a, a little, um, sheet of material that helps block as well. And I've, and I've gone through and measured like a lot of different, um, these like tools, like to see, like, does it actually lower, you know, cause things, some things say they do, but it, some things may only block it in one direction, but not in the other. So like, I have a thing on my phone that blocks the, the, the that goes over the screen essentially. So when I'm talking, um, if I'm on speakerphone, you know, it's, it's away from me, but then I have the headphones that basically don't even have speakers in them. The headphones, uh, run, use air. <laughs> so like the speakers are much farther down the, uh, the cord and then it pumps. And then the, the what goes into your ears is actually the vibrations of the sound. Like it's just like a little tube of air that pumps it in. So you're basically just trying to do things to, and, and does that, you know, am I going overboard? You know, I, I just, I'm basically like, I'm rather be safe than sorry. And it's not like I'm a drastic change to anything. I'm just mitigating things. Um, but I do feel like, you know, the, we're just bathed in all this radiation now <laughs> and we're not going to really know, you know, we, in terms of like, is, you know, I, I, I mean, there's definitely stuff happening now with things like, okay, people have put cell phones against their head every day talking on it. I mean, I, I've seen family members, friends, and, you know, have some, some major issues in the last few years and they're all, and the, the fact that they're all in the same spot on the brain was like, that freaked me out. Just give us a snapshot of the gym you're talking about in New York city. Sure. So the the facility just opened um, kind of soft launch a few months back. It's called Hacked Fitness, H uh, A C K D Fitness, and the the concept is really just about efficient exercise and, and recovery. So both strength training, uh, cardiovascular fitness, and using the latest in technology. So you can call it a biohacking gym or things like that. But you know, I don't want to word it like that so it scares anyone away because it's there's a lot of even if someone doesn't consider themselves a biohacker, it's just people who are like New Yorkers and people are really time strapped and you could be an executive just, you know, like, look, I only got an hour a week to train or, you know, you're a busy parent, things like that. And so uh, people can come by and, and check out the equipment. There's training programs. So it's all goal based. There's coaching programs. If somebody says, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, over the next six weeks, I, my goal is that, you know, that they're trying to improve body composition and, and, you know, get, uh, lose some fat, gain some muscle. Or some people might be training for a marathon. I, we have people who might be going out to climb Kilimanjaro. And so they want to do things that are more going to allow them to be more, um, be able to better use oxygen. So we'll do things like oxygen training where we, we connect them to a, uh, a 
a reservoir that has uh, concentrated levels of oxygen and we go between high oxygen states and low and we challenge the body and we get it used to uh, dealing with low, you know, going down to really low levels, but then rebounding and the body just, that translates into better efficiency when training and other um, like strength training, et cetera. Cause you can basically, we're getting the body more oxygenated to produce more ATP. Um, uh, and, you know, and on the recovery side, people come in and, and there's some cool biohacking tech there where it's, um, there's a device called nano V that you basically are breathing in this, uh, essentially it's like a humidif- humidified air. It just feels like air blowing in your face, but the air is actually treated with, um, the vapor is treated with an infrared signal so that when you inhale it, it's like a systemic delivery of like this infrared signal that it's the same signal your body uses that the cells communicate with when they're receiving oxidative stress. So they start going into this like repair mode. Uh, so we're, we're basically tricking the body <laughs> into thinking it's getting all this damage, but it's not. So it gives it a chance to like proactively start going through and repair. So it's different than taking antioxidants because antioxidants, yeah, the lower oxidative stress levels, but they don't repair. This is both, this is doing kind of both. Um, you know, and there, and there's some cool assessment tech there, things like 3d body scanning, uh, we got this, the, this device that's kind of like the, the first of its kind, uh, metabolic analyzer. So we can do all sorts of cool things like while you're training on different things. So like <clears throat> if you like to do kettlebell workouts, well, we can, while you're doing your kettlebell workouts, show you, are you burning fat for fuel or are you burning carbohydrates or, you know, glucose, like what, what's your fuel source? And someone might think they're really, you know, adapted one way or the other, and we can show them they're not, or we can show someone what's the optimal, like if they're going to run, what's the optimal pace that they can run at to uh, take most advantage of the fuel source they're going for. And so, so there's some really cool things, um, you know, and, and it's only been open a few months. So we're just scratching the surface. And then, you know, and what's cool is as this te- as technologies come and new tools are out there, you know, we evaluate and look at what things make most sense. Like what's, what, what's going to add a benefit to that versus just being like a shiny object, you know, some piece of equipment that's just like, okay, you know, we have it and, um, people can play around with it because um, I do think, you know, it's cool to have all this tech, but without, without having any kind of goals, um, people got, you know, people are going to get bored. They're going to be like, well, it's cool to play around with. It's just like, it's just like track, you know, self-tracking. It's like, you're going to buy all these wearables and these different tools and you're like, well, that's cool. But if I'm not getting any insights or not really have, don't have any direction with it, I just get bored and I'm going to throw it away, you know, after a few weeks. So, Bob, you talked a lot about the sophisticated tools that you built for yourself. What are some of the tools that maybe somebody just getting going can use to track their own data? Yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of people, they, they want to get some insights. And, you know, we're not all data scientists. I mean, actually, I'm not even a data scientist. I just happen to have a background in technology. But um, even if you're just tracking a few things in a spreadsheet, there, there's some web-based tools where you can just upload that data and then do some analysis where, you know, can find correlations or do some nice um kind of visualizations. And so there's one tool called Statwing and I believe it's free. And, um, you, you basically just go on, you can upload your Excel, your, your spreadsheet and it'll figure out things like in terms of, uh, correlations. So like I did an experiment with glucose tracking and it would show me, uh, it would show me like, for example, uh, you know, be like, Oh, well, well on days where you played soccer in the evening, the next morning, your fasting glucose was always lower and it was, you know, probably pretty obvious, but it was, but it could do some interesting correlations there. Um, where, where most people get a little over their heads is if you try to do, uh, you try to correlate more than one thing with each other. Cause often we're saying if X, if X then Y, but there might be three or four things at play. So if you can, if you've got all those variables and you upload it into a tool like Statwing, it can figure out like what among those variables have some level of, uh, correlation with each other. There's, um, there's another, if you want to do some nice visualizations, um, there's a, uh, what's another web-based tool. It's called Plotly and they have a, uh, they have this tool that kind of lets, kind of works the same way. You upload your information. It's kind of like a web-based, almost like spreadsheet. And then you can just, um, click and design like a nice visualization. Um, if you want to do like expert mode, if you have a, if you can program, there's a Python whole thing underneath. So you can just make, you know, you can generate your own, write your own scripts to kind of produce the same thing, but they make it so that anyone can just go in and start doing it. And there's another product out there called, um, Xenobase, which works again. It's a, it's a aggregation tool as long with 
you can run some correlations and, and data analysis on it and they, they make some nice graphs and, and things like that. So there's, there's definitely these free products out there to, to do it. Um, you know, if you're, if you just want to see some really pretty dashboards and beautiful, like data visualizations, I mean, there's a, uh, there's an app called gyroscope, which, um, just lets you connect in, for example, like your, uh, like connect to Apple health and, and other things, but they make like, just, it's really beautiful data. It doesn't necessarily give you any kind of like feedback and insights, but if you just want to have like a cool, like, like, I think it was uh, a cool thing I did was I looked at my location data over a period of time and they did a really beautiful, like made a map that like kind of did like a heat map showing where you've been. And, and it was cool. It's like, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of turning data into art in a way. So it just depends on what your goals are. I mean, if you're, if you just want to like get into the data and get some analysis, the, the tools I mentioned work great. Um, if you want to get more into the, just, you know, turning the data and in, in nicer visualizations, there's some apps and tools that will do that for you as well, but they may not provide you with the, not necessarily insights. Uh, I'm just going to do some of our standard living in 200 questions. Most of these are like short answer type of things. And um, so if money were no object, what personal therapies would you try? Well, I would definitely bank my stems, do some stem cell banking. Now in terms of using stem cells, um, there's different treatments out there. Um, I, w- I would probably experiment uh, with some. I mean, just, just as a general sort of therapeutic, um, there's also, uh, yeah, I would say that's about it right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm care like I researched the hell out of things. And I'm not, you know, and instead of just saying I'm gonna go do some gene therapy, yeah, I'm not the person who's just gonna jump in and do it. Like I want to make sure it's vetted and the safety's been, uh, you know, really kind of put out there. You read my mind. So if personal safety were guaranteed and there were no long-term ill health effects, what would you try? I would do things to, to lengthen my telomeres. <laughs> If you could live 20% longer or have a 20% better quality of life for the same length, which would you choose? I mean, I, I'm all about uh, health span. So um, I would rather have years in my life than, uh, I'm sorry, having life in my years and adding uh, years to my life. Got it. So you be, you live 20% better, not necessarily 20% longer. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, they show these, like with all these fasting studies, they're, you know, longevity, the, the one, the animals that live the longest are like skinny and cold and whatever. And, you know, is that, is that worth an extra 20% to live like, live like that? Or would you rather have a fulfilling life right up until like the end? All right. This is the full lightning round. So when I, when I name one of these things, you can either answer by, this is part of my regular routine. I've tried it. I have no interest in it. I've never heard of it, or I think it's probably snake oil. Yeah. You ready? Okay. Microbiome testing. Uh, I've done it. Performance blood testing. Uh, I've done it. Telomere testing or lengthening. Uh, I've done the testing. Uh, have some mixed um, things about it. Not that I doubt it. It's more that I don't think we have sample sizes that are big enough yet to give us proper feedback but you can tell if things are lengthening or not but we don't know what's good or bad heavy metal testing done it all right we've been through some of these but intermittent fasting 24 hours yep done it longer fast three days done it uh blue light glasses part of my daily routine chili pad or other things that control temperature of your bed uh not part of my routine but i I, because i i don't need to cool it but i believe in it blackout curtains part of my daily routine infrared sauna Part of my daily routine Regular sort of cold water pool plunges. Almost daily routine. Cryotherapy, so it's super cold. Periodically, yes. Float tanks? Periodically, yes. Hyperbaric oxygen? I've done it. Brain sensing headbands or training, like, say, for example, a halo? Use it pretty often. EMS? Uh, in some form or another, um, pretty often. Butter coffee? Daily routine. Alkaline water? Not quite daily routine. MCT oil? Uh, uh, periodically. Amino acid supplements? Uh, workout days. NAD? Had used it. Um, not currently using it. Nootropics like aniracetam? Periodically. Um, I just took some L-theanine before the call. Modafinil? Uh, haven't done it. Nicotine? Uh, occasionally. PRP? Haven't done it. Uh, IPS cell banking? Haven't done it. Gene therapy or editing? Uh, haven't done it. And if you could, and we had a brain-computer interface, how close to the front of the line would you want to be as our entire brain like the entire everything outsourced the whole cortex like everything 
I don't, I don't know. It doesn't exist. Yeah. So well, know. my whole my whole thing is I feel it's a bit snake oil only because you can store information, you can put stuff out there, but you can't basically plug a our body. Like we have so much neurotransmitters in our gut and stuff. I feel like you can't replace what's actually the signaling of everything in the body by just sticking the brain onto like a computer. <laughs> so I feel like there's a there's got to be a middle ground there. Well, it's been awesome to have you on the show today. Thank you for sharing all your information and especially the technology stuff for a lot of software developers who listen, they'll be, they'll be geeking out on that and uh, really appreciated talking with you. Yeah. Thanks again. It's been great. You've been listening to another episode of how to live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L 200 crew that includes Lauren Krayinski and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com, or find us on Twitter or Instagram at How to Live to 200, where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well.